Okay, Math 170. In Section 3.2, we're going to exercise our, our proving muscles a little bit more. Uh, we're, it's titled the Mean Value Theorem, but we first go over Rawls Theorem um, to kind of jump into this. So just a reminder of whenever you're trying to uh, prove something or verify theorems, uh, you always want to make sure the, the hypothesis is satisfied. before you can conclude the following. So we kind of did that a lot with our delta epsilon. We really hammered in on that, but uh, it happens for a lot of properties and theorems and, and stuff that you end up using or utilizing when you write proofs. So we have a little practice with this, uh, applying it to actual functions. So Rawls theorem, is asking us or telling us f is a function and it's supposed to satisfy the following conditions. Number one, f is continuous on the closed interval a, b. Two, f is differentiable on the open interval a, b. And three, the function evaluated at the endpoints have equal values. If all three conditions are satisfied, then you can conclude there's a number C in the interval A, B, such that F prime C equals zero. Does that remind us of anything? Whenever the derivative of something was zero at a point, something to do, or there's a reason why they use C? We talked a little bit about critical numbers. So it's kind of applying what we learned or piggybacking on what we were talking about in the last section. So we're just going to practice uh, so that we can really understand the idea of the logic behind this. Uh, example one's asking us to verify Rawls theorem for the function f of x is 4 minus x plus 2 square on the closed interval negative 4, 0, and assuming all of those conditions and the hypothesis hold, uh, we're going to find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion of the Rawls theorem. So I think that kind of talks about like critical numbers from there. So the first thing, uh, I always like to number it, kind of helps me kind of keep everything in line, um, is F continuous on the closed interval? So first thing we decide is who is F? I like that. And so all of your experience from pre-calculus, um, we noticed that that is a parabola that is facing downwards, a little shift to the left, shift to the right. Um, oh, well, actually it'd be shift to the left, and I think it's shifted upwards. So yeah, you can graph it, but we can actually say, well, it is a polynomial. And we all know polynomials are continuous everywhere, so if they're continuous everywhere, they're going to be continuous on their closed interval. So you need to state this. Don't just assume that the reader knows what you're talking about. So I always say since F is a polynomial, it is continuous on all real numbers. Therefore, it's continuous on the closed interval, negative four, zero. So condition number one, we have justified. Condition number two, we wanna ask ourselves, is our function differentiable on the open interval? So I guess if we're not, if we're excluding the negative four and the zero, well, we already know we have a polynomial, so we, we're kind of happy here at this point. Um, F is a polynomial, um, so we like differentiating polynomials because they're kind of quicker and we know they always work. So again, you're gonna state again, F is a polynomial. Um, it kind of has the same reasoning. It is differentiable.
on all real numbers. Um, so therefore, it has to be differentiable on the open interval. Excuse me. Almost was going to say closed. So we're, we're verifying and stating. Um, the last case for the condition so that we can jump to our conclusion is we want to calculate what is the function evaluated at the two endpoints. So reminder, two endpoints, I got negative four. So that would be us calculating f of negative four. And then, so you don't forget, might be to your benefit to write out work or notate that you're also going to calculate f of zero. And since it's relatively quick to plug um, things in, um, my polynomial is what four minus, this will be negative four plus two, square. Do a little math, we have what four minus negative two square, four minus four, which equals zero. Okay. And so all we want to make sure is when we do plug in zero, do we get zero back? Not, not because we started with zero, it's because we are doing the comparison. So we're going to have to compare to this number. Sometimes that gets confusing with a lot of numbers going on. So f of zero, we're going to plug this in. We're verifying. So you should show that you're at least plugging the zero in. I do realize there's some steps that can be skipped at this point. But we do show that we're trying to calculate it. So that gives us um, 4 minus 2 squared, or 4 minus 4. We kind of already did this already. So that gives us 0. You see how we're comparing? And since they are equal, you have to state it. You can't just compare and be like, ah, there you go. So always state the three conditions based on the conditions of your function given. So we are good to go. The next thing we're going to do is state the conclusion in terms of our given conditions, not just the generic Rawls theorem, it's the Rawls theorem applied to this particular parabola. So if I want to make my conclusion, I can kind of recopy the wording, it's helpful. Um, there is a number we don't know what it is yet, C in the open interval negative four zeros. So remember you, you're relating it to your problem such that the derivative of the function evaluated at C has to equal zero. There's my notation for such that again. It looks like a backwards epsilon in a sense. You can write it out in English too. So that is Rawls theorem, but the last part of the problem is asking us to find all numbers C. So the last part, uh, let's find C. And so remember, we're taking the idea that the derivative of the function, and then if I go back to my function, um, derivative of the constant part zero, but I could take the derivative of negative x plus two squared to be negative two times x plus two to the first power. You could also add on the chain, attach on the chain link if you'd like. Um, remember, we could clean it up a bit. You don't really have to write the one if you know that's gonna happen. We're going to set it equal to zero and we'll solve. So that gives us x plus two, the negative two divides out equals zero, our x equals negative two. And just a note to yourself, 
is it in your interval? Remember, we're kind of looking at our interval one more time. So just note, you don't have to write this in the proof, but uh, negative two is in your open interval. That's supposed to happen based on this theorem. So what they end up saying, um, technically you just found your critical number um, based on kind of your definition. So you can say uh, C is equal to negative two. And if you want to restate it so that we're, we're clear, um, the derivative evaluated at negative two is equal to zero, therefore Rawls theorem holds. Now, technically, they really just wanted from us at that last part is to find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion. So we just have to circle the critical number, but sometimes the convention of renaming the X value uh, C is kind of where we're, we're looking at. So that's all there is to it. Um, don't get too lazy, I should say, on the first part. I know a lot of these seem obvious to you at this point, but when you're asked to prove something, you're asked to formally state it. So just kind of take your time, be patient. Uh, we'll do another one just to make sure you're, you're um, okay. We'll exercise those trig muscles a bit. So same sort of idea. We're verifying Rawls theorem for f of x equals cosine two x on the closed interval negative pi over eight to seven pi over eight. And then we wanna find all numbers C that satisfy the conclusion. So in the case, it's kind of like a critical number. So let's kind of go through those conditions one more time. Um, are we continuous? with our function, um, well, f of x equals cosine of 2x. That is a trig function, a nice wave uh, of the cosine. It's continuous um, on the open interval negative infinity to positive infinity. Therefore, it has to be continuous on the given interval, negative pi over eight to seven pi over eight. Okay, so con uh, condition number one, We're all good to go. Second idea, let's talk about differentiability. Um, can we differentiate cosine of two x? And so the question is, is it, is it continuous? We already know that it is. Is it smooth? Yes, it is. Um, there's no sharp corners. We, we kind of have, the, we know the behavior of how cosine works, even if we have a, a 2x affecting the period a bit. But we do know, yeah, we're okay. But you have to state it. So f of x uh, equals cosine 2x. Or if you just wanted to say f of x because you're applying the, to the example above, I'd be okay with that. Um, it's differentiable. Um, everywhere so therefore it's differentiable and I'll uh, I'll abbreviate we could do that on the open interval negative pi over 8 to 7 pi over 8 and what's the issue it's smooth everywhere so be careful that's not really an issue it's like the, the condition okay so the last step we pull in some algebra just to verify. We're just going to verify that the function evaluated at the endpoints, um, we want to see if they're equal. They're telling us they are, but we need to verify it. So we need to show this. So don't assume. So we want to calculate the function evaluated at negative pi over eight. So that is cosine of two times negative pi over eight. And also while I'm here, I might as well set up what's happening at the seven pi over eight. That way, don't get 
lost uh, along the way and forget anything. So I have cosine of two times seven pi over eight. Here we go. So now we just kind of simplify the argument of the trig function. Uh, two times negative pi over eight, I'm getting negative pi over four. And maybe you can use your, your idea that cosine is an even function to help you visualize a little bit better. And we all know that the, why am I saying a negative, excuse me, even function, the, the cosine of negative x is just the same as the cosine of positive x. And cosine of pi over four gives us a chance to, to think back about the unit circle. That is actually square root of two over two. And so just double checking, see if the other side, okay, cosine. So we have two times seven over eight. We can reduce, that's gonna give us cosine of seven pi over four. And then we can kind of see if it helps you, you can do a quick sketch and say, oh, what does that look like on the unit circle? I believe seven pi over four is in quadrant four. So that means it's gonna be positive. And then, then you can use the reference angle pi over four to get the same thing back. That's the square root of two over two. So you're, you're showing this, but don't forget, you have to restate it because you are, are verifying it. So the function evaluated at pi over eight is equal to the function evaluated at seven pi over eight. So we have just verified the third condition. Okay, now conclusion wise, could kind of refer back to Rawls theorem and say, what's supposed to happen? So let's state it. Um, there is a number uh, C, that's a kind of critical, in, I can use, uh, I can use a little notation in negative pi over eight to seven pi over eight, such that f prime c equals zero. Perhaps it's critical, we'll see. So the next thing we have to do is just find the c. And so usually with finding the c, it has to do with taking the derivative. So I just have to go back and refer to my function because I've been writing a lot lately. It's cosine of two x. So you have to remember, derivative of cosine is negative sine, but we had a chain. So we're taking the derivative of the inside. So that gives us two. So maybe we just clean it up a little bit. Um, sometimes people get confused with the chain link that actually is in the front of the trig argument and um, in terms of the, the trig function, not in the argument. And this is gonna give us a chance to set it equal to zero. And then we get a chance to solve. So we haven't done this in a while. Um, we've got sine, sine of two X equals zero, that two negative two can divide out. And then this is kind of where we're thinking. Sometimes it really does help to draw a quick sketch. Um, first thing you have to think about is where is uh, sine of x equal to zero? So sine is zero on the unit circle at zero and pi. So that's where you set your argument equal to. So in our case, our argument is not just an x, so we can't just find the answer we have is 2x equals. Now there's more than a way to approach this. Remember, we're not just specifying, um, when you talk about negative pi over eight to seven pi over eight, that's not in just between um, zero and two pi like we're used to solving. Uh, what we wanna look at is maybe just saying, okay, um, is there a way to write us moving around from zero to pi all the way through? So a nice quick little formula as we go. And so that means we can start at, we could start at zero because that's the, the first angle measurement. 
And then if you rotate um, about pi times k, you're going to hit your second value. And you can keep rotating a half a circle around, and then that's where we're getting our, our two values um, forever and ever. So that's all the solutions, except we need to find who x is. So remember, we divide both sides by 2. So um, we still have a 0 going on. But now we have pi over 2 times k. And remember, we assume you, you have this, but remember, k is an integer. Want a fancier way to write that? I think they use the, the z if you don't like writing English, if that helps you. So if you'd like, um, you kind of keep in, in mind um, when k equals 0. Oh, you guess you don't have to write the 0 if that's something that bothers you. You actually have a formula for all solutions. Well, sometimes we like to clean things up, don't we? So the problem is we need to care about our particular interval. So what we're looking at is you just pick all these values of k and just make sure that you don't go too far because we need to stay inside negative pi over 8 to 7 pi over 8. So um, you can pick, usually people like to start at 0. Um, but I kind of noticed that my interval had a negative pi over 8. However, if I started at k equals negative 1, I'd be too far beyond the negative pi over 8 because I'd have negative pi over 2. That's why I can start at 0. So if k equals 0, um, we, just, we just get the x value equals 0. And then just go up counting with the integers. k equals 1, we get x equals pi over 2. And just check before you keep going. That should be in our interval. Remember, we're looking at this. K equals 2. Um, that's going to give us x equals pi. Still in the interval. Yes. OK. Let's move on. K equals 3. So that is um, pi over 2 times 3, which gives you 3 pi over 2. Still in the interval, negative pi over 8 to 7 pi over 8. Um, if it helps you, you, you could, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if it's interesting, you can, you can convert to degrees or you can just um, maybe convert the, the endpoints of the interval to decimals and just make sure you're not going beyond that. that. That could be another option if you're not too comfortable with radians. Please try to be comfortable with radians, though we're in calculus. We're going to use these a lot in Calc 2, so, and a lot in here, too. So let's just double check if we have k equals 4 k equals 4 is pi over 2 times 4. x would give us 2 pi. Uh, notice we'd be outside the interval. We would be outside the interval. Or am I already outside the interval too? Let, let's double check. 7 pi over 8 is a proper fraction. Let's play. So we have x equals 0. We're good. I think I went too far. I got too excited. That's OK. c would equal 0, because that's inside the interval. Um, pi over 2. Pi over 2. Inside the interval. And you guys are thinking, why are you taking so long? Well, what I'm trying to see is maybe, maybe I'm giving you an alternative. Sometimes on the very last steps, our brains are exhausted, and we tend to gloss over things. So I want to just make sure. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's abbreviate this, abbreviate, approximate it. So let's go. Um, so I'm computing in my calculator. Um, pi over 8, just to give me an idea of what I'm looking for. So that's about negative 0.392. Uh, 393. Approximated. 
and then 7 pi over 8. There we go. And of course, if you're bored, then of course, that's the cool part about watching a video. You, you can fast forward, but some people like to see this. So 2.749 approximately. So that kind of helps me see where I'm going. So by the way, if I'm, if I'm looking at x equals zero or c equals zero, that is for sure in the interval that we're speaking about, they mean the same thing. Now pi over two, if, if I want to approximate pi over two, I could ask um, pi divided by two, second pi divided by two gives us 1.57. If that's something that you want to look at, that's in the interval, we're good to go. Um, pi, 3.14, are we, are we in the interval? Nope, we're done. I went too far. I got really excited there. Um, so remember, pi, what was that, 3.14? That's beyond your interval. So uh, we can say, we can now say, what are the only two values that, that matter to us? C equals 0, and C equals pi over two, and we are good to go. We finally found all the numbers in that particular interval. Now, if they widened that interval out, maybe they said uh, negative pi over eight to, um, you know, we could say two pi. Then we can start playing around with the three pi over two and the, and the two pi as well. Um, but I just really wanted to verify. Um, sometimes that those radians aren't as, uh, we call it easy to picture uh, when we're kind of looking at intervals that have pi's over eights in them. Yeah, we'll play with it. So I think you'll pretty be, be pretty clear on on uh, the math for this. Maybe if you're a little confused about trig functions, it's a really good time to review solving trig equations. Um, nothing too complicated like we saw in trig class, but enough to know where to locate things on the unit circle. Uh, what I do want to look at though one application or a little special case here or kind of the overall idea there's the mean value theorem hence the title of our section and if you look at the difference between the conditions so we have our hypothesis of the mean value theorem to Rawls theorem uh, don't we notice that we're missing something? We go back. Do, 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 do. We go back. And it's the Rolf's theorem part. We are missing the functions evaluated at the endpoints being equal. So if we run into a case where we don't have that to be the case, um, condition number three cannot be verified or it's not the case, we have the mean value theorem. And if these two conditions hold, then we have a conclusion. They actually give us some information about the derivative at a certain point. There's a number C in AB such that the derivative evaluated at that point, it may not be equal to zero, it's actually numbers. And does that look familiar to you? That formula, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Hmm. Well, let's interpret. Let's interpret with a picture. Sometimes that helps me see why or what it means. Uh, so let me find a function on, on an, I guess, a closed interval. So we got a, b. So I'll do something. I like curvy, so we'll go with this. And let's see, it's A, we have the endpoints, and B, endpoint, A. And if I want to interpret the conclusion, um, F of B minus F of A, let's look at this. Um, let's kind of talk about. Okay, 
They're talking about the corresponding y values. If I can. Uh, I should say B. There we go. Okay. And that gives me that is a that is very familiar to me. It's something something to do with the the slope of the secant line, difference of the y values over differences of the x values. Yeah. That by the way, that's gonna be significant. I need a, a ruler or a straight edge. So that, my friends, is the secant line, our slope of the secant line. Sometimes we haven't pulled these up in a long time. So this is the slope of the secant line. And if I want to draw it, a secant line, it's, oops, sorry about that. Let's go back. Or you, you see, you see what I see. There we go. You probably still see the screen. Everything went blank for me. Okay, so let me draw with you the secant line. And notice it's the secant line through the points, um, A comma F of A and B comma F of B. And I'll do some erasing because I want to make sure, not that. Ah. Let's see if it lets me, nope. Oh, well, we'll go with it. So we have the secant line through, just so that we're restating it, so you guys can make the connection. We have A comma F of A and B comma F of B. Okay. Now, they are trying to tell us that the slope of the tangent line should equal to the slope of the secant line. You guys recognize this? F prime C, slope of tangent at X equals C. So I have to figure out where would that be? Well, first things first, let's see if we can draw a, if the slopes are supposed to be equal, then we should be able to draw a tangent line. So that was probably going to have to tell me where C is located. And it's there. It's in between that interval. So that's really, really cool. Kind of neat to see. I uh, just want to make sure we're clear. Um, the, the mathematics behind this statement, what they're trying to say um, somewhere in the interval A, B, so open interval or closed interval, I should say. The slope of the tangent line is matching the slope of the secant line. Super cool. Let me write this down for you. Uh, somewhere in, in, in AB, let, let's be a little bit more clear there. Somewhere in AB, the slope of the tangent is going to equal the slope of the secant that passes through the endpoints of the interval. Pretty, pretty cool. Now we'll apply it in a second or so, but just kind of keep in mind notation versus the English um, case of it so that we can actually say in English what's happening. Sometimes that's a little easier to memorize than what the theorem is, is actually saying in math speak. So one more, one more idea just to kind of hone in on. Check this out. 
thought this is pretty neat. Um, if the third condition of the Rawls theorem was holding, okay, so it doesn't have to hold, but what they're trying to tell us is that your function of evaluated at the endpoint A and the function is equal to the y value evaluated at the function x equals b. Sorry, I got tongue tied. So let's kind of draw a case of this. I have a and b. And what's happening is, okay, the function is continuous on a and b. Um, it's differentiable on a and b. So I'm thinking not only continuous, but no sharp corners. So I think what I'm seeing, if I can, um, they both should have the same y value. Okay. And so that would be uh, located f of a and the same thing as f of b, whatever that number happens to be. If it's smooth and differentiable, um, let's kind of look at it this way. You can draw it the other way around if you want, it doesn't matter to me. But let's try this again. Let's talk about the secant line. What does the secant line do? Uh, secant line passes through the two endpoints. Uh, in this case, we could pass through any two points, but let's draw that. Get our straight edge out. Okay. And what's supposed to happen, by the way, the slope of the secant line, we can clearly say we could play with the formula differences of the y's. What is that? f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, if they're equal, f of b, f of a are zero when you, they kind of, do, what do you call it? Neutralize out and b minus a, some sort of distance, it is a positive number. So zero over anything is zero. But you probably can see that visually. But what happens is there's supposed to be a point C somewhere along in the interval AB, such that if you draw a tangent line with the same slope as the secant line, so in our case, the slope is zero, okay? I didn't quite hit the function. I'm a perfectionist sometimes. See if it will let me. Yeah, better. So this is the cool part. What's the slope of the tangent line? Well, it has to be zero. So what's, what's actually happening is Rawls theorem, it's actually a special case of the mean value theorem. It's just what happens when your function is equal at the two endpoints. I thought that's pretty cool. I really think that's really neat to, to visualize. A lot of times we go through these, these theorems and we just say, okay, yeah, conditions are met. Yeah, yeah, whatever. But really, really makes the difference when we actually see the pictures. And sometimes just drawing them out yourself kind of helps you memorize things a little bit better if, if you ever have to use them later. Play around with this. This stuff is not easy. There's a lot of, um, a lot of theory going on that in, and you're probably going to feel a little uncomfortable at first, but you've been through enough calculus already, you keep working at it. So let's finish off this section. We're going to verify the mean value theorem this time for a polynomial on 0, 2. And then we're going to find the, the number C that's going to satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So um, lucky for us, mean value theorem only has two conditions. So um, first condition is we want to make sure that the function itself is continuous on the closed interval. And we do have a polynomial, so we can say f is a polynomial. Um, and continuous 
on everywhere, I should say, negative infinity to infinity. Um, so f is also continuous. Has to be continuous on the closed interval. That's part of negative infinity to infinity. Condition one check. Now two, we're asking ourselves, is f differentiable on the open interval? Well, we're a polynomial again. If we're a polynomial, we're smooth. Smooth polynomials are differentiable, so we can say f is differentiable. On negative infinity to infinity, so it's also differentiable. Um, on the open interval, 0, 2. Remember, we're relating it back to our conditions of the particular function given. So now they didn't specify anything about the function evaluated at the end point, so there's nothing to, to, to talk about at that point. Only two things to verify. If this is the case, these two things hold, the conclusion says there exists a number, they like to call it C, um, in the open interval 0, 2, such that the slope of the tangent line, you don't have to write what I'm writing in, in red, but it does help when we're trying to memorize stuff, is equal to the slope of the secant line. So remember in this case, it would be f of b minus f of a, I keep trying to use the generic speak, all over b minus a. And so that is called the slope of the secant line, by the way. Kind of helps us memorize the formulas a bit. So, um, we don't, we could do a couple things if we want to, but we could actually find what that derivative is without having to take the actual derivative, my friends. We can do it and we can see, but we could kind of say, okay, what is the slope? Uh, we have to find out who is the function and let's evaluate it at two and zero. Let me look back, two X squared. Okay, so off to the side. I have f of x equals, I have such a short memory, I have to check back, 2x squared minus 3x plus 1. My apologies. So if you're going to evaluate what's f of 2, we have 2 times 2 squared minus 3 times 2 plus 1, or you can use your ti. 2 times 4 minus 6 plus 1. What is that? 8 minus 6 plus 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3. Okay, so f of 2 is 3 um, minus, now we're looking at, I shouldn't put a division bar, f of 0, we don't need too much calculator, that's equal to 1. So 3 minus 1, and again it's over 2 minus 0. So 3 minus 1 is 2, 2 minus 0 is 2, over 1. Oh my goodness, so f prime c is equal to 1. So one more time, the slope of the tangent line at C is equal to the slope of the secant line through, what is that, F of 2 and F of 0. We could put the order pairs if you'd like. Now let's double check for a second. We do have the conclusion of the mean value theorem taken care of, but the very last issue, see, I'm always reading the direction. They wanted to, us to find the number C that satisfies the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So the last thing we have to do is figure out who that C would be. So find C. Well, 
this is where we can bring back. Um, well, I, I, I know the derivative is supposed to equal 1 at C. So let's figure out what the derivative is equal to. That's kind of a good place to start. Usually when you're lost, nah, take the derivative. Let's start there. Okay, so the derivative of f of x, I'm seeing the top right, 2x squared minus 3x plus 1, I'm getting uh, 4x minus 3. Okay, got that taken care of. And now what we're trying to understand is f prime c, so what we're doing is let, let's just replace x with c. That's, that's all we're doing is seeing that c is actual a number. So I have f prime of c equals 4, I would like to color code there, uh, so we equals 4 times c minus 3. And this time you're setting it equal to not 0, I know that's kind of common for us, but it's 1 based off of the mean value theorem. So that's going to give us the equation for us to solve. So that gives us what? 4c equals, we add 3 to both sides, we get 4. And conveniently, divide by 4 both sides, we actually get c equals 1. Now before, before I get happy and circle everything, the last thing I do is just check. I want to check and make sure that your c, what we think it's supposed to be, is in the specified interval. And what was the specified interval? Let's go back. We are almost there. It was 0, 2. Is um, 1 in the interval 0, 2? Yes, it is. So we can actually find that C value. We can clearly state and confidently state this. That's a tough one today. There's a lot of theory going on. Take some time and practice. I will see you in section 3.3.